This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. So, Ben Affleck's in rehab. You hear about that? See the picture of him in the car? It's pretty messed up, right? It's pretty fucked, isn't it? I mean, sheesh. But, but this here isn't some celebrity TMZ gossip shit. This is nitpicks. This is honest to God, legitimate genreism. Also, you guys voted for it on my Twitter again. I'm forever bound to my fans. I love you guys. Ben Affleck is a man of many talents. He's a writer, actor, and director. We all went crazy over Argo, Best Picture Oscar, Holy Moly Cannoli. And then what does Ben Affleck do next? His next venture is his magnum opus, a film which for the first time has the Affleck solely involved in every creative process. Argo was written by someone else, and with his other films, at least he had someone to bounce ideas off of. But 2016's Live By Night is for the Affleck purists. It's fully written, directed, and starring the booty chin himself. Now, what is it about this particular project that made you want to uh, take on the writing, the uh, being I wanted to make a really fun, exciting, compelling What's up with the Batman movie, movie, man? Are you gonna direct it or True, what? but I find that you some sometimes you do your best work when it feels the easiest. When it's I just have to ask you, Ben, the moment Sam sees you for the first time as Batman. Ben's at the top of his game, he's one of the best directors in the world. Uh, also, if you're casting the Batman, perfect Vicky Brown. Well, I think I look at this movie as the culmination of the my movies so far. I wouldn't have been able to make this scope and scale. Way, Batman, Superman I was in my top 10 of the year. All right. Please direct Batman. <laughs> Is this video the story of a man who went to rehab because no one acknowledged his genius? Or is it the story of a man who went to rehab because he realized he wasn't a genius? All these questions and more will be answered now. Ben Affleck wrote three films before Live By Night. Good Will Hunting, Gone Baby Gone, and The Town. But those three low-budget films have made over $400 million at the box office. Ooh, we got ourselves a little Hollywood golden boy over here. But to say Live By Night flopped is an understatement. Theatres are obliged to show a film for two weeks. Then, in the third week, it's up to them. Ideally, they keep showing a film if it was selling tickets. In the first two weeks, Live By Night was being shown in 2,822 theatres. In the third week, it was being shown in 163. That's a loss of 94%, which is the second worst in recorded cinematic history. Number one goes to this monstrosity. But is Live By Night really that bad? To find out, let's go through this film with a fine comb and understand the truth behind Ben Affleck. In the opening sequence of Live By Night, we're introduced to Joe Coughlin, a man who, after seeing the horrors of World War I, decided to never follow orders again, and now lives as an outlaw performing robberies. All this information is conveyed to us with a voiceover, with black and white still images. In 1917, I signed up to fight the Huns in France. A voiceover is generally seen as a pretty lazy writing device to begin with, but there's a lot of examples of voiceover being used as competent and effective narrative tools. Good voiceover will show the individual characteristics of the protagonist. Maybe they're cocky, funny, shy, calm, frantic. You get the point. Sometimes you'll get an unreliable narrator whose deluded view of the world will create dramatic irony, or they'll express a deep vulnerability that they wouldn't normally express, adding a sense of intimacy between the viewer and the character. However, if you strip away this sort of creative intention, an opening voiceover simply becomes the director reading the plot of his film to you. This is how we begin Live By Night, with Affleck objectively describing our protagonist's given objectives, backstory, and the main philosophies that drive him. This would be a pretty lazy move even in a novel, but when you have all the visual opportunities that exist in film, this is undeniably bad writing. However, we've let the Affleck get away with this before, since he used this very same narrative tool in his last two films. But we didn't notice since those films actually had relevant visuals to go along with these otherwise pretentious badly written voiceovers. Maybe the people he was collaborating with nudged him in the right direction. But not this time, gang. This is Affleck at his purest, and this is the result. The least inspired, worst way you can open a film. A good day was filled by sleep, 
and a good night spent running too hard to look back. As this monologue goes on, we get some real footage over the top of it, and little scenes to break up the monologue, which is quite exciting. We see Joe and his group of outlaws rob a card game. He's stealing from notorious Irish gangster Albert White. I know this because Ben tells me. He also tells me that Albert White is in a war over booze with Italian mobster Masso. We see the rivaling gangs murder each other in a stylistic and engaging sequence. This sequence is so good that you almost forget about the terrible voiceover and slowly warm to the film. These fun, punchy visuals set a great tone and show how dangerous these two mobsters can be. So what if Live By Night got off to a bad start? We've got two warring factions. Our protagonist has pissed one of them off. Maybe we'll get a double agent sort of thing, a man playing both sides in a war that isn't his. This is an interesting setup. There's gotta be some dire consequences for stealing Albert White's poker money. They wouldn't just show this heist if it wasn't important. Right? Well, Albert White pays Joe a visit. He tells him not to steal from him, and it's never mentioned ever again. Then why did they show it? So we can introduce the romance aspect, you cretin! This is Albert White Squidge, but Joe is lampooning her. I love you. That's forbidden love. Ah, the shitty male fantasy love story. This is a classic Affleck trope. In Good Will Hunting, Will meets a beautiful, kind, cheeky woman who falls hopelessly in love with him. But he gets really aggressive and nasty towards her. God, I just want to be with don't you because bullshit. I love you! Don't bullshit me! Don't you fucking bullshit me! You. But this doesn't stop her from accepting him back with open arms because he's so darn amazing. This wasn't too bad because Matt Damon is a good actor and him and Minnie Driver have chemistry. But it gets a little creepy and predatory when it comes to the town. Ben Affleck plays a bank robber who takes a woman as hostage. He lets her go but then stalks her to a laundrette. He plays innocent, lying about who he is and what he does. They start dating, she's flawless and idolizes the ground he walks on. Which reads to love dialogue, which is what we'd call in the business corny. People get up every day and they do the same thing. They tell themselves they're going to change their life one day and they never do. I'm going to change mine. Why don't you do it with me? This sort of corny romance might have its place in a film which leans more in the direction of Titanic or Romeo and Juliet. However, when you put this level of corniness in your otherwise gritty and dark action heist movie, it only serves to make the film feel tonally conflicted and works against the other aspects of the film. And I'm pretty sure Affleck is the one responsible for the terrible romantic dialogue in the town, as it insipidly rears its ugly head for a huge chunk of Live By Night. Cause she's gone, baby. He said it! He said it! Do you ever read that paper, The, the Town? That, that, there it is! There it is! Go where we want to go. Sleep by day. Oh! Oh, God. Joe is in love with Emma, Albert White's girlfriend. They both know if White finds out, they'll get moided, but they're just too horny to stop. Also, this might just be me, but there's something deeply uncomfortable about Affleck writing and directing his own softcore sex scenes. Because why else would you make a film if you can't write yourself into relationships with attractive women? Joe decides that he needs to do one last job so he can get the money together to move to California with Emma. On this one last job, Joe's a getaway driver. He sits there daydreaming for a bit, and then, when the time comes to shine, he reverses into the car behind him and everything goes to shit. Car chase, car chase, car chase. This might have been engaging if everything didn't just immediately go wrong after a mere few seconds. A good high sequence will have a sense of tension to it. We'll understand the consequences if the heist goes wrong, we'll be aware of the risks involved, there'll be close saves, and the element of danger will be really emphasized. But this is no drive. Joe mentions a vague job, it cuts to the job going wrong, and then there's an overly drawn out, clean, slick car chase sequence. We don't know any of the people he's working with or have a sense of who he's stealing from or how much. The police come out of nowhere, everyone dies, but Joe gets away. 
police officers have been killed due to his actions, but he doesn't seem to be remorseful about it in any way. Ben Affleck has a habit of writing characters for himself who are really, really nice and sensitive, but also violent and often criminal to varying degrees. The result is the worst sort of anti-hero characters, good guys who do bad things. This juxtaposition doesn't offer depth, we're just watching boring criminals. If you're supposed to be an empathetic, emotional, caring bloke, don't take part in a job that involves murdering innocent people. This is because generally, Ben Affleck only likes to play good guys. <laughs> I'm not the bad guy, kid. He runs to the party to meet Emma, but oh no, she betrays him, and now Joe gets well and truly fucked up, which seems to have a lot of parallels to Affleck's real life. But before they manage to kill him, the police interrupt and take him into custody. The chief of police is Joe's father. I didn't mention him before because he doesn't do anything. I'm only mentioning it now because I feel obligated to. And he gives the warm news to his son that his girlfriend is dead. She, um, drove off a bridge? Joe goes to prison for three years. We don't see any of it, and then he's just out. His dad died of a heart attack while he was there and is never mentioned again. Screenwriting. Even though Joe is in prison for three entire years and his dad dies while he's in the pen, Affleck is entirely unchanged. He's still buff and sexy and doesn't seem like he's sustained any sort of emotional trauma. He's now just set on avenging the death of his love and joins Meso's crew to ruin Albert White because he blames him for her bad driving. That's the first act, 35 minutes, and this is honestly the best part of the film. From here, the narrative becomes something else entirely and abandons almost everything it's set up. Structurally, this script is deeply, deeply fucked. There are narrative beats that are dropped and never mentioned again, characters that are introduced only to be forgotten about, and nothing particularly defining about our protagonist, aside from that he's in love. This is the end of Act 1, our protagonist has been irreversibly changed, which is what you want. A big event to get the plot going, but you want the end of Act 2 to be an even bigger event and Act 3 to top everything else in the narrative. In Live By Night, Act 1 ends with our protagonist being betrayed by the love of his life, who then dies. Joe is sent to prison for three years. This is huge and is by far the biggest thing that happens in the film. The rest of the film slivers on with minor annoyances happening here and there, but it lacks any narrative impact because we've already seen Joe at his lowest point. But even when you look at this film on a scene by scene basis, it's the same kind hearted murderer from the town, the same inhuman romance from Goodwill Hunting, and the same stereotypes as Gone Baby Gone. And after Affleck written movie feels like it belongs in the 90s. It conveys people, plot and romance in that same corny, slightly overly filmic way which got dated a long time ago. Sure, that works for you in 1997's Good Will Hunting when you have competent actors disguising the hokey dialogue, but Live By Night is 2016. Audiences want more meat on their bones and Robin Williams is dead. But come on, Affleck isn't really known for writing, is he? That's just a small fraction of this man's repertoire. You ask anyone on the street, who the fuck is Ben Affleck? And they'll confidently look you in the eye and say, an actor. And yes, Ben Affleck is an actor. That's confirmed. But what type of actor? He has a large filmography, which I've obsessively reviewed over for a long period of time, and I have an answer a bad one. Ben Affleck can play one role well, a reserved manly man who keeps to himself and is a little bit fucked off all the time. That's what we get in Gone Girl, Argo, Daredevil, Chasing Amy, and it works. Sometimes. But Ben has done a lot of movies. Gone Girl and Argo aren't the majority of his work. Oftentimes, he will be seen wearing the suit of a well-meaning, kind-hearted, sexy, down-to-earth hero. But let me tell you right now, that suit is too large for him, as he always plays every role with the same drained energy of a single dad who cheated on his wife. As he walks around with his mouth slightly agape and his tired, vacant eyes, you ask yourself, 
is this the man who's going to save the day? It's rare that we see Ben Affleck really bring anything other than himself to a role, but despite producers knowing exactly what they're going to get when they cast Ben Affleck in anything, he is regularly miscast. With Live By Night, Affleck amazingly miscasts himself, writing a character that needs to look and sound like a 1930s criminal, but Affleck doesn't do an accent or change his physicality or gestures, he's just playing himself. Even if that doesn't work for the character and setting that he himself wrote. Leonardo DiCaprio isn't exactly a varied performer, he mostly plays himself, but you can see him putting in the effort with something like Shutter Island. Maybe Affleck just needed to work with a better director. Masso orders Joe to move to Tampa and manage the liquor down there. He takes his mustachioed compadre along with him. They sit and talk with the police chief. Then they sit and talk with the guys managing the booze. Then they sit and talk with the Cubans who deliver the rum. There's a lot of sitting and talking and Joe arranging things for his boss. This might be entertaining or interesting if Affleck decided to bring any sort of charisma or any type of energy to the role. Joe threatens the booze guy, but Affleck performs this scene with such an unimposing character casualness. Everything comes to a grinding halt as each and every character engages in what seems to be bland, monotonous business talk, in which nothing is challenged, everyone fully complies, and no one really expresses anything. Joe's come into a completely new environment to run a business he has no experience in. He's very much an underdog here, but this conflict is never explored. It feels like he's been assigned to manage and run a book club rather than an illegal rum operation. Joe very quickly starts to date this perfect, flawless, beautiful, Cuban rum trader. I mean it when I say perfect. She sets up shelters in Cuba for women in poverty and is virtuous, kind, and empathetic. Even though she runs an illegal rum enterprise and does business with the scummiest men in the country, but whatever, they are legit in love now. Legit. It's at this point, when we're watching a man with no real goals, in a generic Hollywood relationship, running a timid, criminal enterprise, that I start to question what filmic aspects Affleck was envisioning when he read the book it's based off. By looking at Affleck's filmography, it seems as though he hasn't got the best tastes in scripts. It seems that he's not really aware of all the different elements that make an engaging or exciting film. His motivation to work on films doesn't come from their artistic intention, but more from how it will make him look. He wanted to be a superhero, twice. He wanted to be an action hero, a ladies man, and he fought incredibly hard to get the lead role in Surviving Christmas. He did this because he wanted to prove he could be funny. You know, this was really hard for me to get them to put me in this movie, you know? They, they, they were like, Ben Affleck doesn't do comedy, he's not funny. There's certain guys who are funny guys, and I was like, the guy who was in movies where things blew up. Affleck also took the leading role in Michael Bay's Armageddon, but he clearly didn't think it was a good film because he had the audacity to go on the DVD commentary and talk about how the script didn't make any sense and make fun of it. I asked Michael why it was easier to train oil drillers to become astronauts than it was to train astronauts to become oil drillers, and he told me to shut, shut, shut the fuck up. If you thought that, why did you say yes to it, Ben? Why did you say yes to Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor three years later, Ben? Plodding around and existing is all anyone seems to do in Live By Night, which might work if the film established itself as being slow paced and dialogue heavy, but the opening 35 minutes is like a mini film in itself. Eventually, after a lot of nothing happening, Joe gets his first dose of conflict, the KKK. More specifically, one guy from the KKK. A real goofball idiot racist. He doesn't like Joe's business with Cubans and seems to have a learning difficulty. <laughs> you all know that. The guy bombs a few cafes owned by Joe, but there's no personal attachment to the people being injured and Joe doesn't even seem that upset about it. So why do we care? It really sucks that the motivation for getting rid of a man in the KKK is so thin. What if he kidnapped his new girlfriend? What if he started spreading fear in the small town community? What if he blew up a cafe that we saw Joe build from the ground up? Joe and the racist sit down and talk a bit. Joe's made to look so smart and superior next to a man who can't wipe his ass properly. I guess a threatening antagonist with actual power would have been too difficult for Affleck to act alongside. Joe can't kill him because he's the police chief's brother-in-law. So Joe skillfully obtains pornographic images of the chief's daughter off screen and surprises him and us with the pictures. Now he has permission to kill the bad man. 
Joe meets up with the bad, evil, racist, bad man in a dramatic showdown. We see the powerful headlights from Affleck's car, but when we cut to Affleck, his face is fully lit up and the headlights behind him are much weaker. Where's the light that's hitting your face coming from? Surely you should be silhouetted because you're supposed to be backlit. You cunt. He shoots the KKK dummy, and then we get this montage about how his gang managed to just clear out every KKK member in Tampa. Just kill them all. We have like 20 minutes dedicated to this one guy, and then the rest of the KKK are just wiped out in a brief montage, and everything is roses again. I'm gonna do something which you might think is a little unfair. I'm going to compare Live By Night to Citizen Kane. Yeah, I know it's a really one-sided, unfair comparison to make, but I just can't help myself. Orson Welles and Ben Affleck are both acting, writing, and directing their films. Though Citizen Kane has a clear disadvantage, being made on a much lower budget, not having access to modern technology, and Orson Welles was much younger and less experienced. How can this old black and white film be any way superior to the 2016 modern classic by Golden Globe winning director Ben Affleck? Both films span over several years and both focus on a singular character transformation. Wells nails both the prosthetics and the performance behind the makeup. We get a sense of his aging, and though the story is told through non-linear flashbacks, you can always place when a certain scene is taking place, because of the varying performances being displayed. In Live By Night, there seems to be no effort put into showing any visual transformation going on with Joe. His clothing changes, but that's about it. This makes it impossible to tell how long the narrative spans for. I know it's like nine years because it starts in 1926 and at one point Prohibition ends, but aside from that, we're in the dark. But it's also his performance that's majorly at fault here. I've already spoken about how Affleck never changes his performance once, he's always playing himself. The same weird, boyish, laid back attitude and low energy that he famously portrayed in Gigi Lee. 92 million dollars. <laughs> This severely affects the pacing as the chief's daughter Loretta is introduced to us as someone who wants to be a Hollywood actor. The next time we hear about her is when Joe drops these pictures, which doesn't look like much but is one of the most important moments in this film. After killing the KKK guy, Loretta emerges as a prominent preacher, speaking out against alcohol and gambling. She's now the new antagonist for Joe, as he wants to build a casino. Loretta has had two major character changes, but because we're not aware of how much time has passed, the changes feel contrived. These changes also happen without foreshadowing. They're revealed as a surprise out of nowhere. It would make just as much sense if she reappeared as a rival gangster or a love interest. Anyway, Joe tries talking to her, but she's way too stubborn. Masso tells him to kill her, but he won't because he's not the bad guy. I'm not the bad guy. <laughs> Prohibition ends, so getting his casino built is his main priority. But how will he get investment when Loretta is telling everyone in Tampa that gambling is bad? Well, he goes to the top businessmen to try and convince them. They tell him that they don't want to work with immigrants. This majorly triggers Affleck, who gives them a whole speech about how racism is bad. All those people, the Negro, on whose back you went to great pains to break this country. And the immigrants who came over here with nothing and worked their fingers to the fucking bone all believed it when you told them they could get ahead. The heavy handed nature of the writing implies that Ben Affleck is so woke that even his gangster character in Prohibition Times is able to stand up for the little guy. But only if it involves building a huge fucking casino that here profit off. The good news is Loretta has now killed herself. So that means that Joe can get his casino built. I think? I mean, we never see it get built, but that's the end of the second act. A majority of the film is Ben Affleck running some gangster shit in Tampa. He has two obstacles and a faint, vague goal of wanting to build a casino. These two obstacles appear and then disappear. They don't have any effect on the protagonist and it never feels as though the narrative is building towards anything. Orson Welles cast himself in the role of Charlie Kane. This is a part that is in no way attractive. Kane is arrogant, cruel, and indulgent. We see him descend into a removed, hostile man who dies miserable and alone. The role is truly challenging. It requires precise acting. Wells threw himself into the role, not because he wanted to look good or because he wanted people to like him, but because he knew he was the best person to play him. In strong contrast to this, the only reason Affleck took on the role of Joe Coughlin was the same reason he plays any character, because he thinks it will make him look good. Because Affleck plays the character just like any other Affleck character, a tired man with his mouth agape. 
This is one of the biggest reasons why this film flopped, because an actor with charm, charisma or discipline may have brought life into this dead production. Any other director in that position with an articulate understanding of one's talent would have cast anyone else to play the role, leaving only one last conclusion to make. Argo is a really great movie. It's well edited, it's a fantastic story with a strong script, and its pin-perfect casting allows the film to really feel living and palpable. Even Affleck is well cast as a reserved man who's a bit fucked off all the time. Argo is a masterpiece, fully deserving of its Best Picture award. However, there's a reason Affleck wasn't even nominated for Best Director. Because Argo isn't made for its directing. Argo is a film that came to life through its editing and writing. A script like Argo with an experienced cast and a cinematographer who worked on these bad boys practically directs itself. Argo isn't badly directed, but I would say that Ben Affleck's directing career seems to have a lot of hand-holding. He had people working with him on the script, big name actors that always give good performances, and experienced producers like George Clooney. But Live By Night is Affleck in the deep end, and he is drowning. If we were ever going to judge Ben Affleck as a director, it would be through Live By Night. But what makes a good director? Why is it that Argo is a great movie, but the directing isn't particularly noteworthy? How can you tell a good director from a bad one? Well, it's no one thing, it's a series of small decisions defined through artistic intention. Road to Perdition is a crime drama set in the same era as Live by Night. It's directed by Academy Award winning director Sam Mendes. When comparing these two films, the difference between a good director and a bad director really starts to show. In Road to Perdition, Mike Sullivan is a gangster and Daniel Craig has beef with him. He tells Sullivan to deliver a message to some bloke. So Sully goes to deliver the letter like the fateful postman he is. Sullivan walks into the light as he tells the doorman his name. The shot is the point of view of the doorman. Sullivan is a dark, dramatic figure who's imposing in on his face. As the doorman frisks Sullivan, the status and dynamics is clear due to the decisions Mendes made when directing the scene. In Live By Night, Masso invites Joe over for a chit chat. Prohibition's just ended, so they've got a lot to talk about. This will be for sure a tense interaction, but Affleck chooses to start the sequence with a driving montage. These shots are pretty, but what's the artistic intention? It's scenic and it's daylight, there's nothing confrontational or imposing about these luscious landscapes. He arrives at the hotel and there's gangsters everywhere. Affleck and his compadre walk through the lobby and to the elevator. As they walk, some gangsters walk with them. The dynamic and status between these characters is undefined. Affleck is framed right at the back. Aside from his white suit, there's nothing visually communicating that he's any different from the other gangsters. Back to Road to Perdition. Daniel Craig is looking pretty fucked. Why? What's gonna happen? This stresses me out! We cut back to Sullivan and the doormat. They walk through the club. This is all in one shot and it visually communicates the sort of man Sullivan is about to meet. What kind of person would run an establishment like this? Lip by Night goes for these half hour shitty long takes of Affleck walking through a bare barrel hotel lobby. Nothing is being communicated visually at all. Masso at this point should be an incredibly rich, powerful gangster, but there's no suspense or tension being built here. Sullivan and the doorman arrive at the owner's office. The owner, a fully sleazy degenerate, panics when he hears the news that Sullivan's arrived. He conceals his gun on his desk and tells the doorman to stick around. Sullivan enters the room. The blocking and camera decisions communicate their status. Sullivan is again framed as an imposing figure who walks towards the camera and takes dominance over the space. Now in Live By Night, ugh, oh, I can't even do this. There's just nothing. Masso meets him at the door, they walk to his hotel room, they sit down directly opposite each other and it cuts from shot to reverse shot. Again, nothing is being visually communicated. It might as well be an audio book. This scene with Masso and Affleck has some strong emotional beats. They start off friendly, but then they start to discuss Loretta. Masso calls him a pussy for not killing her, and then Masso basically tells Joe that he's replacing him with his son, who's weirdly been standing in the background of this scene the whole time. Joe argues, but when Masso threatens him, he backs down. Then they stand up and walk towards the door. There's virtually no blocking, and there's no change in camera or editing. Nothing visually to make these beats dynamic or engaging. This is one of the most important sequences in Live By Night, and it's shot like any other sequence in this film. In Road to Perdition, Sullivan gives the owner the letter and everything visually changes. We go in closer on the faces of the two men. There's a silent intensity. The owner reads the letter. 
Sullivan looks at the owner. The owner gestures to his bodyguard. Look, look, look. Gun. Oh, fuck! Back to shite by night. They're all standing around and Masso says this out of nowhere. You know, Joseph, what I like about Albert White. What? Surprise! Albert White has been hiding in my hotel room all this time. That's a bit weird. I haven't even heard anything about Albert White for like an hour. I kind of forgot he even existed. But Joe has his own surprise up his sleeve hole. Surprise! All my gangster friends have been hiding under the hotel and now they know it's the right time to pop out and kill everyone. Isn't that real epic style? In Road to Perdition, after the two men are dead, Sullivan reads the note and boom. Surprise. Makes sense why Daniel Craig was all shook. Everything aligns in a natural way. All the subtext is foreshadowed from the very beginning and we didn't even know it. The way Sullivan is steeped in shadow at the start communicates that this isn't simply another day at the office. There's something happening underneath everything. But until the note is revealed, we don't know what that is. All of this is communicated through the effective directing which understands the value of subtlety. In Live By Night, both these men have huge secrets. However, there is no attempt to try and convey this through how the characters interact, nor how they are framed. The conversation is directly literal, making the scene excruciatingly drab. The characters simply address each other until the surprise twists. There is no thought placed around each character's given circumstances, and the potential of the scene is entirely missed. There's no mood established, there's no tension. It's simply a series of occurrences. This scene changes everything since Joe Coffin eradicates all his enemies, but it never truly feels important. This energy continues as Joe and his crew kill everyone. Once again, there doesn't seem to be any suspense or element of stress within this action sequence. Once again, there are no risks or close calls. They just easily overpower and kill this hella powerful gangster. Albert White is shot so unceremoniously, even Joe seems a bit disappointed. Once everyone's dead, Affleck retires with this really half-baked speech that fully belongs in the 90s. Whoever well, wants to go back up to Boston has my blessing, go ahead. If any want to stay down here where the sun is warm and the girls are pretty, we got jobs for you. He ritualistically passes the torch to his mustachioed compadre from the beginning of the film, a man who doesn't seem to have displayed any form of leadership skills, but is treated like a really serious and deep moment. As a director, one of the most important things to maintain is tone, so that when you want to have a soppy, cringy speech where you're treated like Jesus, maybe don't put it at the tail end of a really brutal and ruthless action sequence. It just leaves people wondering what the fuck your film actually is. Joe retires from his life of crime, he he lives with his son and his perfect wife. I guess we're supposed to be happy for him, but this utterly unconvincing love plot has had hardly any development and feels just like countless other uninspired Hollywood love stories. Is this film supposed to be a love story? Well, I think a part of it wants to be, but it's also trying to be three other films at the same time. As a side note, Joe finds out the first girl he was dating actually faked her death, and Joe goes to visit her. They caked her in authentic 30s makeup, but test audiences hated it, so it's been toned down with the help of CGI. They stand and talk, but nothing new is learned, and it doesn't give the film any additional meaning or purpose. Similar to Joe's dad in the film, I've only mentioned this for the sake of accuracy, but its presence in the story seems utterly inconsequential. So now what? Is it over yet? It seems like everything has been tied up with a neat little bow, but Remember when I said that scene where Affleck showed the Chief those pictures was really important? Well, this is why. The Chief has now gone all loopy and he seems to blame Joe for everything that happened to his daughter. Even though all he really did was take her to rehab and inform her dad what happened to her. But for the sake of giving us the illusion that this narrative is clever, he blames Joe for what happened. The Chief shows up outside Joe's house and starts shooting up the place with revolvers. Joe manages to protect his son, but his totally perfect wife gets shot in the fucking face. See what they did there? Joe's actions have come back to haunt him, even though again it doesn't even really make sense. But yeah, now Joe is sad, but he still has his son and after crying a bit, he seems fine and lives what I would assume is a happy life. Sadly, we can't say the same for Ben's real life. <laughs> When I was doing this movie, it took me two years to get it together, but nobody ever asked me, what is live by night? You know, they asked me, 
So, did Ben Affleck end up in rehab because of how shit Live By Night was? No, definitely not. I'm sure the man has his own problems and I hope that he makes a full and healthy recovery. I completely wish for his success moving forward. In this video, I judged him as an artist and not as an individual. But did Live By Night ruin his creative momentum and make me reframe how I perceive him as an artist? Definitely. Because overall, Ben Affleck feels like a creator who wanted to do it all, without putting the time in to truly understand his craft. When I started this project, I was hoping to gain some deeper insight into Ben Affleck as an individual, to understand what he is passionate about and to examine his inspirations and aspirations. However, after exploring his filmography, I'm left with very little in the way of an actual sincere or personal presence in his work. Instead, what I got was a person who wanted to prove he was a good writer, a person who wanted to prove he was a good actor, and a person who wanted to prove they were a good director. The end result is a series of products which don't belong in today's cinematic space. Because it's not enough to prove you can do these things, you need to have a deeper intention that you are aiming to achieve. Because without that, all you are left with is moving images. But what do you think about Ben Affleck? Let me know down below and make sure to subscribe for more premium content. Follow me on Twitter to vote on my next vid, but since you made it this far into the video, let me tell you something. Now, I know what my audience is. I have no illusions. I know you all like to engage with shady shit. That's why you need ExpressVPN. Let me tell you now, you don't know what real Japanese porn is until you're actually on Japanese Pornhub. Don't worry, no one will know because ExpressVPN protects your personal data as well. And maybe after that wank, you might want to check out some independent cinema to forget about that deep, deep shame. Well, VPN to Australia and go over to SBS On Demand and check out some banging indie cinema. So come on, help out the channel and help out yourself by installing the fastest VPN in the world. Take back your internet privacy today and find out how you can get free mums free by clicking the link in the description box expressvpn.com slash nitpicks that's e-x-p-r-e-s-s vpn.com slash nitpicks for free mums free with a one year package visit expressvpn.com slash nitpicks to learn more take back your privacy today